dig in today in the Gospel of John. Before we get to that, last week uh, you heard from uh, Kate and I. Uh, Kate serves on our Kids Central CNY board, and we told you about a need that we have um, discerned here based on really the upheaval in the back-to-school schedule, the hybrid model, remote learning, and so on. So based on the urgent need and based on the expressed interest and also based on your um, response, we have been able to open our preschool this season and also open a uh, child care, school-age child care program this season. So we're going we're gonna to open our doors and our hearts to the, to the neighborhoods and the kids and their families, and we're going to collect whoever um, we can, and we're going to give them socially distanced hugs. So we're so... We're so um, we're so grateful for the opportunity. We have the resources. We've made a huge investment. And um, just in time, things fell into place for us to um, really make a wholehearted effort at connecting and caring for our neighborhood families. So would you be in prayer about that? Not only do we need you to pray, we would love for you to start referring us. Uh, still, uh, even in the, in the days and... and um, era of social media and so on, the number one source of promotion and connection comes word of mouth. So uh, if you have a mouth and you can form some words, we'd love for you to advocate for us and uh, get the word out that we want to take care of school-age kids and preschool kids, and uh, we're grateful for, for, uh, for that. So we're in our series together here um, called Who Does Jesus Think He Is? And if you are married or if you are in business, you probably didn't take someone's word for it when they referred you to this person who you married and went into business with, right? You did, I'm assuming that most of you didn't marry somebody um, and it was a blind date marriage, I'm assuming that you didn't get into business with somebody who came highly recommended, but you never met. Because we know, right, that trusting somebody, uh, trusting someone else's words about someone is not wise. It tends not to be accurate. By the way, anybody ever met someone, and then as you're meeting them and getting to know them, you start thinking to yourself, I misjudged them. Someone told me about them. I heard about them. I had... Now, I know none of you do things like that, but occasionally there are people who get ensnared uh, in those ways, and then you discover, that's, I don't really recognize who someone told me uh, they were. And the reason is because when we judge someone on someone else's words, it tends to be distorted, right? It's not really the real picture of who someone is. It also gets diluted. It doesn't help us always understand what version of this person they really are. So, if you wouldn't take someone else's word for it and then marry someone, if you wouldn't take someone else's word for it and then go into business with somebody, you probably would be not wise not to take someone else's word for it and then rest your eternal salvation in who someone said that this person was, right? there would be a lack of wisdom and accuracy in doing that. Trusting someone else's words about someone will always be risky, even more so in the way in which we rest our heart's joy and trust in someone else. Jesus didn't expect that you would rest your trust in someone else's words about himself. Jesus didn't expect you to hear someone else describing Jesus and then you say, yeah, I think I'm making my decision about Jesus based on their words. Because if you were to listen to other people describe Jesus, you'd hear versions of Jesus that weren't quite accurate, that are distorted or diluted. I mean, if you listen to historians, you would hear them describe to you that Jesus is an important figure, but he's only an important figure in history. If you listen to academics, they would say Jesus is for sure real, and he uh, is truly 
um, existed. The historians tell us that, and, and academics or secular humanists would say, but he's primarily a wise teacher. What he teaches is helpful and can help you morally or religiously. If you read or listened to the Muslims or the Quran, you would discover that Jesus is regarded as a very important prophet alongside Muhammad. But that's all he is. He's just another prophet. Social justice workers would say Jesus was a uh, social justice warrior, always advocating politically for the upheaval of uh, oppression and fighting against the oppression of those who are in power. If you listen to the atheists, you would hear them describe Jesus as primarily a myth for people like you, mostly, who are weak, and you need a crutch or you need some fable or fantasy to believe in in order to really make it through, um, through life. And if you listen to the agnostics, they would say that Jesus is, he, he's a typical religious leader who may or may not be divine. He may or may not be God. He may or may not be who he said he is, but we just don't know. If you listen to American gospel preachers, they would say Jesus is the key figure, the key character, the essential piece of God's plan and desire to prosper your life. And that's who he is. That's how you understand Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, God gives you health and wealth. So, here's what I want you to see today. We're going to learn together another picture of who Jesus is. That if you rest your hope, and if you believe Jesus to be one of those people that I just described, if that's your version of Jesus, you're probably not experiencing life change. And if, you're, and if you're not experiencing life change, it's helpful for us to discover that I'm not experiencing life change because it's, it's quite possible I don't really know the real Jesus. It, it, for sure, I don't know the Jesus who he thinks he is. If you only know one of those Jesuses that's described by somebody else, then he won't. That version of Jesus can't change your life. He certainly can't lead you to the Father in heaven. The best way for us to know our rescuing Savior is to listen to how he describes himself. Jesus uses I am statements. And we talked about that last week, how I am is a loaded phrase. You can't miss that. Jesus isn't using I am the way you and I might use I am. But he's using I am statements, and it reveals something significant about him. It is true, right, that if you and I use I am statements and we say, I am a father, I am a husband, I am a wife, I am a teacher, I am a, a, a child, I'm an employer, I'm a, I'm a um, business owner, I'm a coach, etc., it reveals something significant about who you are and what you do. It tells people something very valuable about the kind of person you are and the things that you do. You're making a big, bold statement about your identity when you say, I am, and then there's something that follows that. When you say, I am a Cowboys fan, you're saying, I'm a future Super Bowl champion. That's what you're saying. It's significant. It's important to listen. How does Jesus describe himself? Look at this. Who does Jesus think he is? Who does Jesus believe himself to be? Who does he explain himself to be? Look at this list of I am's that he uses. I am the bread of life. We'll do that today. I am the light. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection. I'm the way. And I'm the vine. And here, this is so important. We're not supposed to just learn these so that we can win in the family Bible trivia game. Instead, we're to read these, and, and it's supposed to light us up with expectation and insight that this is God's character. Jesus is revealing to us who he is. In other words, this is revealing to us something important. It's helping us to understand that he has glorious character, and he describes that to us with these phrases, and also it's a motivator to worship. 
we'll be reviewing this idea every single week of the series, that he says, I am, all these things, and it, not just for us to fill our brains with knowledge, but for us to see his glorious character more clearly, and also as an impetus for us to worship him. Our life with Jesus isn't compelled by religion, it isn't compelled by expectation, it's not compelled by tradition, it's based on a clear grasp of who He is. And today we're going to learn together Jesus' description of Himself, I am the bread of life. And we're going to see and savor this picture of who He reveals Himself to be together. You must know Jesus in His own words to really worship Him. So here's our big idea today. Jesus thinks about himself, that he was sent by God to satisfy our deepest cravings, both now and also for eternity or forever. Do you remember where you were when you ate your first peanut butter and jelly sandwich on Wonder Bread? Who remembers that? I remember exactly where I was when I had my first sandwich made with Wonder Bread in the 70s. Bread. Jesus says to himself, I am the, says to you, I am the bread of life. And bread, I wish this wasn't true. I wish your pastor was more spiritual. I wish that I instantly, when I heard Jesus say bread of life, I I wish that I instantly thought of him breaking himself and passing his broken body out to us. But I don't. I think of Wonder Bread. I think of this brilliant idea to put uh, white carbs and sugar into into an oven and bake it and then put peanut butter on it and jelly on it. And then later on, by God's grace, then there came Nutella for us. But after Wonder Bread, I discovered something called cheesy garlic bread. So when I was young and dumb, I thought, Wonder Bread, that's the best you can get. And then as I grew up, someone introduced me to a gateway drug called cheesy garlic bread. Would you, would you, would it hurt your feelings if we just looked at that for a few seconds? (laughs) It's so embarrassing. Then came the, the discovery of artisan bread. And Tuscan, I don't mind a Tuscan bread. Homemade, out of the oven, crunchy crust soft and melty in the middle, a little garlic butter. But that's not where it stopped. My addiction grew. I went from the gateway drug all the way into almond croissants, (laughs) toasted in the toaster. Then, of course, the only way you could improve bread is to twist dessert into it, right? Once you... once. (laughs) Once you're addicted to bread, it's like, where do I go from here? Here's an idea. Twist some dessert into it. The only problem with bread, there's really only one problem with bread, and the only problem really with bread is that just a little doesn't satisfy. And when you're done with the bread, you're not done forever. You're starting to think about the next slice of bread. That's how I work, especially around 9 p.m. If I go for bread around 9 p.m., I'm up in the wee hours of the night eating more bread. (laughs) I'm not just awake. And the problem is that bread, as we understand it, never fully satisfies. It's satisfying, but it doesn't leave us full. It leaves us craving more bread. And there's reasons why that happens to our body. I learned that the more I eat, the more I want. Uh, It always leads to craving more. And It's filling, but it's not fulfilling, right? So this is important for us to know because Jesus describes himself as the bread. And I like to think of himself, think of him uh, in the terms that he uses. And he says, I'm the bread of life. We're going to learn together here in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, Jesus is describing himself to people who are following him. And you can follow along with with me here. We're going to look at Jesus in his own words describing himself as bread. Starting with verse 28. We're in chapter 6. We'll look at verse 28 all the way down. Um, Specifically, uh, we'll stop at verse 35. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. 
Well, what should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they were journeyed through the, des- the, the wilderness. The scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Everybody say life. He gives life to the world. We're going to dive into that. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. What is the true bread that gives life to the world? Here's what Jesus is saying. It's Jesus himself. It's not religion. It's not the Christian faith. It's not churches. It's not membership. It's not prayer. It's not all the things that you can do to practice your faith. The the life that came from heaven isn't living a better life as a Christian or uh, to stop living a bad life as a non-believer. The real bread of life that God gives us to understand him, to consume him, to be nourished in him is Jesus himself. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So who does Jesus think he is? Does he really think he's bread? Here's what he says. Jesus replies to them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. The original hearers of this, here's what they would have been listening and hearing. If they were listening to Jesus, they would have been hearing him talk about two things, not just himself in bread, but they would have just seen Jesus miraculously feed a crowd of people, and they were a ravenous crowd, and it was a a, a disruptive crowd, and Jesus had just soothed them by feeding them miraculously with just a few loaves and fishes. But they would have also been thinking about how God had provided manna for the Israelites in the desert. Two things they would have thought of. They just experienced a miracle with a couple of loaves and fishes from Jesus. And then their ancestors experienced a miracle as God fed them in the wilderness with manna that had come miraculously from heaven. But Jesus clarifies this, and I want you to notice this. Jesus makes a specific distinction here that there's two kinds of hunger. There's two kinds of hunger. There's physical hunger and there's spiritual hunger, right? Did you know that? That there is not just the physical hunger of your body, but there's also a spiritual hunger that we're hardwired with. And number one, here's here's what we're going to take away here from this passage. There's a deeper appetite in humans. There's a deeper appetite and it's beyond physical hunger. That means that there is more of our um, appetite than just feeding our bodies something made of physical bread. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and he gives life to the world. So there's bread, right, which is manna, feeds the body, but then there is the true bread, true life, which comes from God as well, and this does something different. It doesn't just feed the body, it feeds the soul. So, there's this, um, the Greek words, this is fascinating, the, the Greek word in the New Testament for life, there's two of them. There's two words for life when the word, phrase bread of life is used. One is, one is the word bios, right? Can you guess what the word bios means? Physical life right? Bios is biology. Bios is um, really, it just simply means biological life. And then there's another word called zoe. Zoe. And zoe is a word used to, to describe something called the quality of life. So zoe is a life full of meaning and significance and exhilaration and joy. And when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, he didn't say, I'm the bread of biological life. Of course, he uses this word zoe, and he says, I am the bread who's come from heaven, and I am the source of zoe. What does that mean? I am the source of a life worth living, significance, importance, value, 
joy and meaning. And zoe is the kind of life that makes life worth living. And Jesus says, don't crave only physical food. There's more. There's not just bios for you to enjoy, right, which is a glimpse of heaven, but there's also zoe, which brings, uh, uh, brings our souls to life. And Jesus says, don't labor just for the food that you're going to eat. Put the work in and labor to make sure that you're feeding yourself zoe, that even if that physical bread is provided by God himself, there's still more. So in other words, even though God provided the manna to the Israelites, that wasn't all there was to live by. Man doesn't live on bread alone. There's more to life than that. And instead, God's people are to long for and live for the spiritual bread that comes down from heaven, and it gives quality life, a zoe life, to the world. And Jesus says, don't get stuck, don't get ensnared only pursuing physical bread to feed your body. Don't crave only physical food, there's more. C.S. Lewis talks about this. C.S. Lewis, a philosopher, author. It's brilliant, right? Here's what he says about our cravings. C.S. Lewis says that creatures are not born with desires unless a satisfaction for that desire exists. Then he gives examples, and he says, baby feels hunger, and the reason a baby feels hunger is because there is something called food that exists. And ducklings want to swim, so there's something provided in the earth called water for the duckling to swim. Humans feel sexual desire, and well, there's a thing as sex. And if, if I find myself, this is worth following along, check this out. If I find myself, this is still C.S. Lewis, a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world, right? Let me, let me see if I can bite-size that for you. If I have cravings that aren't satisfied, then it isn't true that this universe is a fraud. It's not true that life is meaningless because I have these longings that are always kind of gnawing at me. It's quite possible that we have been made this way with cravings, appetites, and thirst because we exist for a world that hasn't quite landed yet or that we haven't quite uh, enjoyed yet. We just have glimpses of it. It's to arouse those interests and desires to suggest that there is a real thing. So if that's so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, but be careful. And here's what C.S. Lewis says. On the other hand, never mistake them for, for the something else of which they are only a kind or a copy or an echo. What is he saying? Jesus gives this description and he says, don't be satisfied just laboring for physical bread, physical hunger, just laboring to satisfy your physical hunger. There's so much more. And C.S. Lewis says there's more because there's more in heaven and there's more from heaven for us to enjoy. One day we'll get there, right? All things new. Pastor Jonathan walked us through the joy and hope of looking forward, but in Jesus comes heaven to earth. His kingdom has come in the person of Jesus, and we can partake of that fulfillment even now as we wait for that. So both the feeding of the crowd and also the feeding of the Israelites manna, it kind of spoke to this greater reality that there's a lasting satisfaction that only comes from heaven. Jesus is not only the bread, but he's the bread of, you already said it, life. The zoe bread that he provides for us. And that is the greater reality, that Jesus thinks he is the bread of life who fills us with our deepest joy and our most satisfying pleasure. I want you to try to take that in. Jesus is not just someone you read about and learn about in Sunday school, children's church, and Sunday morning services when the pastor tells you he's really important. Instead, way beyond that, Jesus believes himself to be the source of your deepest joy and your most satisfying 
pleasure. That's a tall order, but He is the bread of life. He's not just the bread. There's so much that He has to offer you. And when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, He's not offering just an eternal existence, but He's offering you eternity now, fulfillment now, a quality of life right now. And just like physical bread satisfies our deepest hunger, this is what he's saying in John chapter 6, just like physical bread brings satisfaction to your physical hunger, at least for a short time, cravings, so Jesus satisfies the longing of our hearts, right? So there is, um, there is some fulfillment in our physical body when we're blowing through all of our cheesy garlic bread or our garlic sticks, garlic knots, or just garlic garlic cloves. There's satisfaction in that. But then, if you can imagine even more and eternally, Jesus satisfies the longing of our hearts. Now, this is important for us to keep in mind. And it's kind of framed by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, in in, in one of his sermons, he said, I heard of some good old woman in a cottage who had nothing but a piece of bread and a little water Lifting up her hand, she said as a blessing, what? All this? She just has bread and water. And she says, all this and Christ Jesus too? The old woman in the cottage, truly, she understands what it meant and what it means that Jesus is the bread of life, that he satisfies her even though she said nothing, had nothing but a piece of bread and a little bit of water, she still sees it with Jesus as abundance. So, we get back to this big idea that Jesus thinks in his own words that he was sent from God. Why? Why was he sent from God? To satisfy our deepest cravings, both now and forever. So, here's a question, and this is vital for us. If you're a a, um, serious Christian, and you're growing and changing, and you want to be nourished and put roots down and bear fruit, you have to ask yourself questions like this. In what do you, this is my question to you, this is the the text question, maybe the Holy Spirit's question to you, in what do you find your deepest joy and lasting satisfaction? In what do you find your deepest joy and lasting satisfaction? Where do you turn to when you're empty? Who do you turn to when you're empty? Where do you turn when you're hungry and thirsty on the inside, when you have those cravings and longings are at work for fulfillment and joy and and satisfaction, who or what or where do you turn when you're experiencing that? And you're searching for more. By the way, Americans think that Jesus, by and large, is a great teacher. 50%, 52%, over 50% of Americans, when surveyed, Newsweek reported this just about a week ago. 52% of Americans say Jesus isn't God. And by the way, you might be thinking, well, obviously this is non-believing, non-Christian, non-evangelicals. This isn't the case. This includes an, an entire sample size of evangelical Christians who believe that Jesus is exclusively and really in his entirety a great teacher that's worth listening to and learning from. Why? Because he's going to help our lives, and he's going to help us be moral, help us be better, and help us be happier. So, if Jesus is only a great teacher, the deepest longings of your heart or your appetite, I would um, kind of mention to you, would probably be needed, it would be needed to satisfy those longings elsewhere, right? Right? If Jesus is only a good teacher, the things that that you need, the love, acceptance, comfort, uh, all of those areas in our lives that go uh, have a craving, there's an appetite and a thirst, you would have to satisfy those elsewhere if Jesus is only a good teacher. He might give you some knowledge and you feel, oh, I feel satisfied with the knowledge that he's given me. But if you're looking for love, you'd have to turn to a human being and you'd have to receive that longing for love from a human being who's failed and flawed, whose love is not unconditional, it's conditional. Even if you married that person, you may find that their love is limited. 
If you wanted acceptance, you'd have to turn to your family and you'd have to turn to your friends and you'd have to pour yourself into receiving from them the acceptance and the, um, um, uh, um, somehow the approval of your friends and family to find that satisfied. If you wanted happiness, you'd probably have to find it in your kids. You'd probably have to turn to your own achievements to feel happy about your own life. And if you were craving comfort, you'd have to rest your, your, your satisfaction in material wealth and your own physical health in order for you to be comfortable. Maybe your savings account. Maybe your career income. If you were looking for meaning, you might venture into trying to help people and make a significant impact on people's lives in our communities and cultures and maybe social justice advocacy and so on. Maybe your own personal success will give you meaning. But listen, if you were craving love, acceptance, comfort, and meaning and happiness, you would have to find it outside of Jesus if he's only a great teacher. But the higher we raise and hold up our friends, our family, human beings, our spouses, our material wealth. The higher we hold that up and the more that we hope in them, the more painful it is when it comes crashing down because they don't satisfy us. Other than my wife, I don't know anybody who has a husband who always satisfies and gratifies and makes his wife happy. One single person on the planet is the only one I know of. The rest of the spouses in the world, disappointed. Parents who hope in their kids, not long after they start walking, that hope starts to collapse. If you've hoped in your material wealth or you hoped in your career, we've just experienced a phase in our culture of the market and the job place and everywhere else where it's all in upheaval and all of a sudden we start to say, I, I crave this and I was filling myself up with this stuff and now it's collapsing. The problem is when it collapses, if you hope in it, it collapses down on top of you and it causes suffering. So let me say that again. The higher you hold it up, the more you hope in it, the more painful it is when it comes collapsing down. And that is painful disappointment that some people live with the rest of their lives. So a couple of questions for you. Why are so many people, why are so many humans still hungry? Here's the reason. They are seeing Jesus but not believing. One of the reasons why someone who's a Christian can be still unsatisfied and still have these longings on the inside is because they see Jesus, they recognize Jesus, they're around Jesus' people, but they don't necessarily believe He is their bread of life. They might believe he's someone else's bread of life, but not theirs. They might believe that Jesus is helpful to them, that Jesus is a nice accessory to enhance your life. They might believe that Jesus is worth emulating and modeling as a good example to us morally, but they don't believe in their heart. They aren't resting their confident hope in Jesus himself. So they see, but they don't believe. By the way, Jesus says, in verse 29, you don't have to do miracles like I am. You don't have to feed thousands with a couple of loaves and fish like I do. The work that the Father gives you is to believe in me. It's not to perform and work and achieve and to do miracles, but instead just to believe that I am the bread of life. But some people pursue Jesus and they only see him. They don't believe in that he is not their daily bread. He's their occasional bread. He's their Sunday bread. He's their seasonal bread, right? Creaster, Christmas and Easter. Seasonal bread. They might see but not believe because they're snacking on Jesus, but they're not really feasting on Jesus. They skim over the surface, and Jesus is like a bag of potato chips. I mean kettle chips, not the lame, thinny, thin ones. I mean kettle chips. In between their meal, and Jesus is just a little skim snack food, and every now and then I have Jesus light, but he isn't nourishing, and he's not bringing me meaningful life. Or there are people who see Jesus and they don't believe because they believe in other things to bring them that Zoe life. Also, they're wishing for more signs. 
Why are so many people still hungry? Because they're wishing for more signs. And here's what this means. To them, Jesus is real, but he's not enough. He's not enough. Like Jesus is good, and I've learned about him. I put my hope in him and stuff, and I can read about him, and and I know he saved my soul. But in reality, that's good, but what's better is signs and wonders. What's better is miraculous intervention. And Jesus says, the only work that I give you is to believe when they say, show us a sign. And he says, I want you to just believe me. Receive me as the bread of life. Yeah, so anyway, show us another sign so we can know who you are. And Jesus says, you already know who you are. I've already described myself. I am the bread of life who's come from heaven. God's provided me. And instead, they're worshiping uh, a diluted Jesus, and that's what happens. They're worshiping a diluted Jesus. This is why so many people are still hungry, because the Jesus that they believe in is just a great teacher. He's interesting, and he's helpful, but he's not really life-changing. He's not really their everyday um, Zoe bread. And Jesus says, come to me daily, continue to believe. There's lasting satisfaction available for you. You'll never be hungry for someone else. If you're, if you're, cons- if you're nourished by the bread of life, you'll never be um, continuing to look and feast on someone else or something else. And Jesus calls us to action. Look what he does. Jesus says, Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. What do they have to do? Come to Jesus. And then what do they have to do? They have to believe. And if they believe, they'll never thirst again. There's a come and see, but there's also a believe and receive. And this is on a daily basis, coming back to Jesus and believing all over again that he is who he says he is. We acknowledge by doing that. Every time we come to Jesus and we see and believe, every time we approach him and he's our daily bread, here's what we do. We acknowledge that there's a deeper hunger beyond the stuff that we're getting and consuming on earth. We're feasting on Jesus knowing that he satisfies us deeply, our deepest cravings, both now and and also forever. Let's pray together. Father, today, we rest our hope in you. And we are mindful that you never intended to make us happy on the outside, to make us smile only on our faces, to satisfy our bodies you intended to reach deep down in our souls. You existed to bring us significance and joy and satisfaction. You, in your own words, are the one who's come from the Father in heaven, and you have arrived here so that you would satisfy our deepest longings, our greatest desires, and be the most satisfaction that we could ever find. Father, this morning with my church family here and those tuned in through our... um, live stream. We know that there are people who we love who have ventured out into discovering, learning, and finding their nourishment, their satisfaction, and their joy outside of Jesus. And we know the results. It's the same for everyone. Emptiness, frustration, disappointment, Father, today, whether they've rested their hope, they've looked for this life outside of you, we pray that you'd allow the disappointment to drive them back. Allow the disappointment to drive them back into into acknowledging that this inner life has an appetite. Help them to acknowledge and also to come and believe every day, to be nourished in daily bread that you are everything that you had promised to us and more, that you are our heaven both on earth and the heaven that we hope for. May our church family discover this in you, not the Christian faith, not Christian people, not Christian disciplines, but literally in the bread of life. We thank you, God, today that you have shown us and described us to us who you are, the bread of life. We believe you and receive you today in Jesus' name.